boys, I'm going to leave this a little open-ended, but where is home? <sighs> you know, it's it's funny. I, I feel like that answer probably would have been different for me like two years ago. Um, and this is going to sound very sappy and sentimental. Um, and I didn't expect it to. I was probably, I was thinking about answering something like, well, the library that I grew up at as a kid or, or this particular place I used to go. But... I think a lot about the fact that home is where you should feel, you know, the, the whole idea is home is where you feel comfortable. Home is where you feel uh, good. And, and I think a lot about the fact that what is my home now is a lot different than what it was even a year or two ago, which is, uh, you know, I've been in a, I've been in a relationship for a couple of years now it comes up on the show and there was just this moment uh, that we were watching a movie and i've got my significant other is is sitting there next to me the the cat is is curled up at uh at at our feet and then this little dog is uh sitting there between us and this time i i don't really get along well with dogs um you know tom has seen this um but this little dog loves the hell out of me um for reasons i'll never understand it has to press itself so up close to me that it's buried in my rib cage and um, I just remember sitting there you know, she, and this little dog's between us and she just looks up at me with this face and these eyes that seem to say, I, I love you more than anything in this world. And I think that I, I'm finally at a place where like home is not a physical space anymore or a particular location. It's just wouldn't matter if that was at the, you know, at the top of the Himalayas or at the, the bottom of the ocean or wherever if there's that little cat and that dog and that girl sitting next to me, that's, that's home. It's just home is, is that little pup looking up at you and, and looking at you like you're the greatest thing in the world, even if you're not. Uh, for me, uh, as with everything in my life, because, uh, I, 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 I am alone. <laughs> I don't have a girl. Uh, I only have my dog, which is always great to have my dog around. She could be a pain in the ass. Uh, and I'm glad to have her, but I am alone, so I don't have such a beautiful sentiment as Mike. But uh, as everything in my life, my empty, uh, pointless existence is um, is is, a, is about movies. So the question of where is home? The only place I have ever felt truly comfortable and at peace, and f- like I felt like I belonged, and I was at ease, and I could just connect with people on a basic level and not have to worry about things is at fantastic fest it's not even so much being at that specific alamo draft house location i've been to plenty of alamos one of my it's probably the best data chain i i could see movies at well not currently but uh you know before in the before times it's that just feeling of community of these are all like-minded people. Even if our tastes are different, we're all here to celebrate movies and drink and eat and just have fun and just, just embrace everything we've loved purely without any distractions where you could, in between movies, just go up to some random person and just be like, hey, what did you just see? Oh, I saw that too. Or, oh, I didn't see that. And just talk about movies. What are you going to do with the rest of the day? And then you just ended up making a new friend and you're now drinking with them and you're hanging out with them and you go into the after party and just all of these things and then just then you've got the movies just new movies seeing movies uh before anybody else can just seeing them fresh in in a theater where yeah festival hype it can be real but just that energy just that rolling emotion that can rush through you after seeing something that you know is just gonna change your life like seeing uh suspiria at fantastic fest was just one of those moments man of just i felt like i'm home you know and the it's the only thing that's really been hard for me in this pandemic because i am an indoor boy so all this has been kind of easy for me but just not being able to go to austin texas for eight days or 10 days to give myself some time uh and just enjoy home has been uh kind of hard and i really do hope i don't have to miss it for a second year because uh it's home and I'm only ever really, truly, fully at peace when I'm there. Click your heels together, follow us down the yellow brick road, and get swept up in our latest episode. You never know where it might take you. 
We're talking 1939's The Wizard of Oz here on You're Missing Out with special guest Caroline Daly. Our guest today is the owner and co-founder of Pod Clubhouse. Caroline Daly joins us today to talk about The Wizard of Oz. Caroline, thanks so much for joining us. Welcome. Hi, guys. Thanks so much for having me. I'm <laughs> so glad you could come by. It's it's funny how it how it worked out was um, I appeared on uh, your show. You and uh, past guest of the show, uh, Mike Caputo, uh, had me on uh, your show interview with the podcast uh, to talk about this show, uh, which I think... I think at the time I, I was on yours, I think we had had maybe three episodes out. It was pretty early great. in. Yeah. And now uh, when people are hearing this, uh, this is like toward the end of the season. So certainly come away. Wow. You guys have grown. Look at yeah. you guys going. It's, it's I'm sure been it's a, all from that interview with the podcast. That was a, that was a bump. It, we, we felt <laughs> the bump. Um, we did. And, and you guys, uh, I was talking to you guys. You guys are great. We had a lot of fun. Went uh, a lot longer than I think any of us expected, and I, I'm pretty sure there were at least three times where I went, "Oh God, we're still rolling." That my favorite part was you go, "Wait, is this is this a part of it?" <laughs> That's my most favorite part. Because <laughs> it went and I, I think it went off on a tangent about what the hell was that Netflix show? I, we were just talking before we <laughs> Emily started about and Paris. Emily and yes, thank you. <laughs> that I yes. I had not watched a single frame of but but your co-host mike had been tweeting about it and i was very confused yeah he got a little nc-17 with his tweets and so yeah it got a lot of attention <laughs> yeah it's it was very bizarre because everybody else was tweeting about it as though it was i don't know uh you know the devil and daniel webster and he was tweeting about it like it was the devil and miss jones like it was a very different vibe absolutely um, <laughs> we typically but... twist things that way so watch out wizard of oz <laughs> <laughs> but um well that was the, the way it worked out as i was you know i said i would love to have you know you guys were great i would love to have you on sometime and then uh mike ha messaged me shortly after and he said hey you said you don't have anyone for intolerance because we were mostly booked up for the first season he said you don't have anyone for intolerance i'll come on and do intolerance and i said great and i kind of said like well we'd love to you know probably in like season two at this point we'd love to get caroline on for something and uh, like the day before he came on for intolerance I realized that, you know, the, the plans we had had for Wizard of Oz weren't really uh, going to happen. And I was like, oh, my God, we have this opening. And I happened to mention to him, I said, do you uh, do you think Caroline would want to do Wizard of Oz? Because uh, you never know. Some people uh, don't like the film. Some people think uh, it's weird. So I asked and he said, I'm sure it'd be great. And reached out to you and you it happily agreed so i'm very glad so what's your history with wizard of oz is it something you grew up with is it something you came to later in life i absolutely did grow up with wizard of oz my parents had it on many times throughout the year as just like something that was always available to the whole family it wasn't something that you know my dad would turn his nose up at or that the little kids couldn't see or something like that so it was always on and we've had a lot of great experiences throughout the years we've gone to a 4d version of it which was pretty exciting we've done um the museum in wamego kansas where we got to actually see all of the little uh, parts of the set and all these different little props and cool things like that. So my kids have grown to love it so much. And yeah, it's just for me, it's just like a comforting, you know, familiar classic that always makes me happy. That very beginning part, just the little, the music, just when the lion is going is enough to make me be like, is that Wizard of Oz going on in there? And I'm like, <laughs> come in from another room because I just love it. It's it's magical. Now, it's funny you mentioned the beginning because I, I grew up loving this film, um, one of the earliest films that I would watch again and again and again, practically till the tape wore down. It's I watched it so much as a kid uh, and so intensely that my idea of the beginning of the film is not the beginning of the actual film. It is the commercial for the laundry detergent that ran before it because <laughs> um, they have, uh, you know, it was this ad, I think it was like Bounty or, or one of them. And it was all the kids dressing up to put on a production of Wizard of Oz. And, you know, it was like and it was all about the memory of the movie. And what struck me is I remember asking uh, my parents, like, well, how did they know about uh, you know, Wizard of Oz? How did the kids know the story before the movie came out? And they just said, well, the book had been around forever, uh, which was an answer that didn't explain that what that ad really was, was an ad shot in the 1980s for the <laughs> tape. So I truly believed uh, throughout my childhood that that was how the movie started. And I think we went to see it in theaters when I was like 11 or 12. And it just went straight into what you mentioned, the MGM lion. And my brain just went, that's not how it starts. 
<laughs> You're like, where are the children? They cut the intro. Yeah, um, <laughs> I didn't put it together. Yeah. Now, Tom, uh, you know, I uh, is this because I don't. Uh, this is certainly not. Uh, you're you're one of the you're one of the exceptions to the rule. This is certainly not without getting into like personal preference. Not something you uh, are are. Uh, I believe you grew up with, right? Uh, no, this is not a movie I grew up with, um, almost to the surprise of every adult in my life at the time, because uh, I did see it as a kid. Um, the details of it remain sketchy. I think I must have saw it in school when I was still in Brooklyn, so it must have been like a first grade or whatever, like, hey, we're watching Wizard of Oz. And I didn't like it. I was my My parents, my aunts and uncles were like, wait, you don't like The Wizard of Oz? They were, like, stunned to find a child that just wasn't enraptured by The Wizard of Oz. And I was like, no, I don't like it. I don't know what to tell you. So I've never really had a connection to it. Um, I've probably re-watched it, like, maybe once or twice in my life since I was a child of just the case, like, it's on TV, I should maybe give it another shot, maybe I've uh, changed in my ways... And um, never worked. Uh, I had the same thought process coming into this episode of, all right, I'm going to rewatch it. It's been a while. I've got this nice, spiffy new 4K Blu-ray disc. It's going to look nice. It's going to sound nice. Let's give it a go. And uh, no, I am immune to the Wizard of Oz's charms. Oh, no. No, but see, that's that's kind of the thing with this with this show and what, what we do with this. Whether or not we personally connect to something, because there are certain movies that and certain works of art that if you didn't grow up with at a, or you didn't watch at a certain age, you or even if you did, like you just don't connect with on that visceral level. And the the goal is getting to the point where you can recognize the value. It's funny because Tom and I each have one of those. Uh, for me, the sort of childhood classic that everybody loves and we'll be talking about it in a couple seasons is ET. There's one that I, I on a on a personal level have no I, I could never engage with as a kid, but it is a thing that I watch and recognize like technically from a technical standpoint this is, you know, a a, a staggering achievement. I just don't vibe with it. And that's sort of the interesting thing with The Wizard of Oz and what we're talking about today is the fact that there are so many of those childhood classic films and those films that we you know, grow up with that are classics because everybody watched them as a kid and has fond feelings for them. But here, you know, with this film in particular, and I think part of the reason why it's inducted in the first year is it's a lot like another inductee we covered previously, which is Star Wars, insofar as it's a thing that it's easy for some people to kind of write off and just go, oh, it's popcorn fluff. Oh, you know, it's just because it's, it's just for babies. But there are so many technical elements to it uh, from a from a filmmaking standpoint that make it a, you know, an undeniable marvel from a uh, from a visual and from a technical standpoint. So there's a lot to cover with this. And I think we should start, as we always do, uh, with the registry statement as to why uh, the film was selected. So this is what the National Film Registry had to say for why they picked The Wizard of Oz. A genuine American classic, the film is based on L. Frank Baum's story of a little girl from Kansas who dreams of a better life somewhere over the rainbow and discovers a magical world of mysterious creatures. Outstanding performances, particularly by Judy Garland, fanciful sets, and an unforgettable score by Harold Arlen and Yip Harburg combined to create cinema perfection. So short and sweet, that's what the National Film Registry had to say for why they picked this film. It's it's so interesting with this. Uh, and since we were talking about people's, uh, you know, response to this as a child, I do want to also note that this is kind of one of those, I think, uh, urtexts that you kind of need to understand... I think American pop culture in general, it is referenced so much uh, in so many different things that to not have this film, not know this story or these quotes, I think, I, I wonder how much you can access other things. Uh, I was talking to my father earlier about it, you know, about the film, uh, which he was kind of, you know, he says, you know, for him, he's an adult, he's kind of lukewarm on the film now. But he said, you know, even think about, you know, 
something that seems as different as if you watch Batman 89 and the Joker gets the water splashed on his face and goes, I'm melting, what a world. What does that mean if you haven't seen this film? There's so much. It has influenced so many people. I mean, you know, in the case of, uh, to talk about filmmakers that, uh, you know, a filmmaker that Tom loves, uh, David Lynch. You would not think of The Wizard of Oz for David Lynch, but he structures his Palme d'Or winning film Wild at Heart around Wizard of Oz. I love John Waters. So many John Waters films are influenced by Wizard of Oz. Two very different directors, uh, both coming from that same place, referring to that same film. So it's kind of, it comes out in a year in 1939, which we've talked about on the show many times, of hugely influential films. And I would argue that whether or not people think it's the best or, or of those, I think it's inarguably the most influential of that entire group. Well, there's no real question about that. I mean, like I've, I've said a few times throughout the run of the show, like I, you, you have to be kind of a myopic asshole to say like, oh, well, I don't like this movie, so it's bad. And like, you can't just, it's, it, it's not important. No, I don't, I don't like the movie. The movie's like, the, the movie drives me up a wall. I can't stand it. But like, I'm not going to sit here and say <laughs> it's not important. Like it's very, it's very clearly important. I mean, even now having like, not like, no matter how many times I watch it, this time still like watching it and being like, oh, I hate every single one of these people. I hope the tornado ruins all of them. And you I'm still can't. I wonder if I was like brought here to, to as like a brainwashing thing to hate the movie. No, no, because trust like... me, that's not where I stand on this. This is just Tom no. having his. I'm completely no, but, like, but, like, of course not. And Tom, I want you to like get this off your heart. Let's work through it. <laughs> No, but like even like like I was saying like even like not caring and with all this and like all the sepia tone section of the movie where it were leading up to the Oz section, the moment where she opens the door and it shifts the color, you you'd have to even still oh. like be a real a, a real stick in the mud to not be yeah. like yeah that's great moment in cinema a moment in cinema that undeniably changed the way people viewed what cinema could be that you could use the art of cinema and the past of cinema and the different tools that cinema had before the current moment to play with storytelling, to play with the way uh, stories are told. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we see it today. I mean, in the much, much less successful prequel that Sam Raimi made 12 years ago, he uses that idea of going from, uh, the four by three black and white to full screen color to show like we're in a different world now we're playing with things and you know uh, we still got filmmakers today doing that shit with Nolan filming in IMAX and uh, you know it's just yeah. it, it opened the world up in a way that is just on that one level undeniable. And to be clear Tom I'm not I wasn't saying all that to talk about your particular stance in film rather than I don't just mean that the film's influence is undeniable. I mean, it is remarkable how this film is is perhaps the most influential of any film in the medium. Well, of course, Citizen Kane is often considered the greatest, and there are plenty of films that are given more uh, respect well, than Wizard of Oz. But I mean, insofar as, for example, uh, not just being in the National Film Registry, not just that, but that even when the United Nations... Uh, they they have a program in UNESCO called the Memory of the World, where they pick a select few pieces of art and culture from every country around the world, and in most cases, it's uh, you know one piece of literature uh, or or a lot of folk music, things like that. Uh, you know, the quintessential artworks from every culture. You know, the 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 Sistine Chapel in Italy, so on and so forth. From America, one of the few works they picked is The Wizard of Oz, which is one of the only films selected for this entire UNESCO memory of the world. It is a, wow. a, a yeah, it's it's a remarkable thing, this, that it is so much a, I, I think that's the thing that's so compelling about this. And, and look, the L. Frank Baum story had been around before and there were adaptations of it before, but, in a way that is, I would love to dissect, but is also hard to necessarily pin down to one particular element. It's just a case where everything kind of came together on this one film to make something that it's it's like there are those few things. It's like how it's like how Mickey Mouse saturated the culture, and you can't quite figure out exactly why. It's not as though you watch 
uh, a Mickey Mouse cartoon next to a, a Felix the Cat or a Bugs Bunny, and you go, well, clearly this is the funniest or the most clever. But for whatever reason, this thing just caught and 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 has this global effect. And I think that that's what's so remarkable about this film is it is just it's a it is a work that seems to define its very medium in a way that that so few works do. You know, I'm, I'm not to not to go over it, but like for example, Carolyn, you know, you were talking about. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you know, I mean, you're a, you're a parent as well as a, I am. Uh, you know, and and it's I you know I I always think about and Tom and I talk about this plenty of times. Neither of us have have children, but we have uh, we have animals who we pretend are. But you know, someday uh, I think we hope to have a, like I hope to to start a family. Uh, you know, I think Tom does as well. And there's always that question of like, what do you show your kids and when? I'm sure you deal with that constantly. Uh, you have you have three children. You said right. I do. I do. They're a little older now. So my guys are 18, 18 and 17. So they're older now, but I still get a lot of questions from them. They are all very worried about doing the right thing all the time. So they'll always ask me like, is this okay if I see this? And we'll have to have a little, a little bounce around like, uh, is this okay? If I see this, I think it is. I think it's fine, but go ahead. I like to believe that at least once you've been like, it's Incredibles too. It's fine. You're yeah. fine. Oh, you have no idea how many times I'm like, why are you asking me? <laughs> but yeah, a lot. They they, they are they are desperate to to keep it keep it above board with mom. So they're like, yeah, no, this is fine, right? And here's the thing: I'll be like, you are 17 years old. Yeah, it has swearing. It. Yeah, you're fine. It's fine. You can see it. It's okay. Also, if it if it's like made after 2005 and it's a PG-13, like you're fine. We don't we don't make <laughs> movies that traumatize kids anymore. Yeah, As which this movie uh, did to an entire generation. Uh, the flying monkey scene is always talked about as one of the uh, sca- things that scared the shit out of kids when they were seeing it on TV or they saw it in the theater or whatever, or the rep screenings. And um, even its own sequel that Disney made for some godforsaken reason in the 80s is pure LSD tinged nightmare fuel, which <laughs> we wouldn't make anymore. I knew we were we we were gonna get maybe a half hour in before Tom brought in Return to Oz, and I'm so happy. <laughs> hey, I didn't. I found an, e- an a natural way into it because no, of course, even a movie as nice and colorful and sweet and like unoffensive and not doing much other than singing some songs and assassinating witches <laughs> has a moment of pure unadulterated oh god oh god i'm going to have a thing about monkeys now for the rest of my life <laughs> and i love that R- wizard of oz walter Murch, and the execs at disney who were too busy trying to not lose all their money so they weren't paying attention to return of oz walter Murch said what if i made an entire movie that was just as un uh, unappealing as the flying monkey sequence and i'm all for it screw up kids make kids watch <laughs> Make kids watch nightmares and <laughs> Well, you'll appreciate this, Tom. I said to my husband, Hey, you know what? Let's break them of asking if it's okay to watch certain movies. Why don't you just go ahead and show them some movies? I'm gonna be away for a couple of days. Just pick some movies that are like a little more adult and just like just throw them in, okay? Solo he shows them audition. <laughs> ready? No, ready? He sh- shows them blazing saddles. Okay. Oh hell yeah. And poltergeist. <laughs> Oh. These are the two movies. Like they go from Disney to this, and I was like, "Wow, those are not the ones I probably was going to jump into." But okay, go for it. That's you fantastic. know what? Listen, Blazing Which Saddles kind of makes sense because it is very childish. But Poltergeist is at the the peak of that '80s sense of like, "Oh, this is PG. It's fine." Steven Spielberg <laughs> yeah. it, and it's just like, "Oh no, this is pure just like opening up a gate of hell and just." <laughs> throwing it into your children's eyes. Yeah, What's so yeah. funny about Poltergeist to me is that um, the most shocking scene in Poltergeist is not any of the scares. I think the most shocking scene in Poltergeist is still every time you go, oh shit, Coach is just lighting up a joint now. <laughs> what yeah. are you doing, Coach? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For our younger listeners, Craig T. Nelson used to star in a show called mm-hmm. Coach. I know he's Mr. Incredible to you, but when mm-hmm. we were young, he was on a show called Coach. <laughs> For our younger listeners, you think they know who, like, they've memorized who voiced Mr. Incredible? He's Mr. Incredible to them, that's and true. that's as far as it goes. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Incredible and Patrick from SpongeBob. It was a football show. Just roll with it, kids. <laughs> 
but um, but I find that so. But I I say about you know especially when you were you said eighteen, eighteen, seven. So you had you had you mm-hmm. know you've had to do that. I think you know that thing especially early on of like well at what point do I show them what and which ones are essential. But I think that what's so interesting is that uh, for virtually anybody, the Wizard of Oz is an is a gimme in that question of well what do i have to make sure they see like you just go yeah of course this is what you show a kid like this is this is a kid movie this is a a movie to grow up with i think i've never thought about it so much as i've thought about it in the last couple of days (laughs) for sure and then i was like oh wow they never really do solve the problem of mrs gulch and toto do they it just kind of ends that is (laughs) that is a a lot of parts that i was like shoot There, there has to be a deleted scene of just like, oh, yeah, by the way, Miss Gulch got just owned by the tornado. So totally fine. <laughs> Can I tell oh. you guys something terrible? And I'm going to admit to something. and It's going to be embarrassing. But it's like one of those things where it's like I recognized that the three farmhands were the the uh, lion, the tin man and the scarecrow. Got that. But it took me way too long to make the connection that the Wicked Witch was Mrs. Gulch. Way too long. Too long, guys. Like, I'm afraid that That's- I... Yes, it was a little like, you know, a, a Santa Claus reveal for me. Like, I was like, wait, then, wait, wait, what? That means that, oh my God, like, way too late. <laughs> it was. Don't feel bad. bad. It was because um, my my significant other to talk about seeing this. My significant other uh, grew up in in. I've said this so many times in the show now, but I uh, grew up in uh, former Soviet Union, Russia, like that. You know, that part of the country, and obviously didn't see Wizard of Oz growing up. You know, that was not her childhood film. Her childhood film was a three hour dramedy about office workers falling in love in the oppressive Soviet climate. So it was very different for kids over there. So she'd never seen Wizard of Oz, didn't know Wizard of Oz. We watched it for her first time last year, and it wasn't until then that I realized that the actor who plays the wizard and and Professor Marvel at the beginning also oh. is the guard at the door. Ne- yeah. I, I, I was like, I've watched this so many times, never picked up on that. <laughs> so don't feel bad. I Yeah, and it's it's terrible because, you know, I mean... That that's so important though to the story, right? You're not recognizing the guard, okay, all right. But how did I not recognize that the villain in real life is the villain in the in her dream part? Like, ay ay ay, that was not good. <laughs> I it's so funny because I feel like of all the people in this movie, because I watched a lot of classic films growing up. You know, I was I was addicted to TCM as a small child because I was just that cool. Um, What's funny because, of course, you know Judy Garland from this movie, and you walk away from this movie recognizing Judy Garland. The other cast members were in films that I watched, but I never picked up on it, other than Margaret Hamilton, who plays the witch. She, when she would pop up in something, even when I was a kid, I was like, oh, okay, she's so distinct, you know? Yeah. And you almost feel bad because, of course, this part followed her around forever. Not that she hated it or anything, but that she just, that was it. That defined her. Her dating life had to take a hit. I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, so much so that uh, there's a famous episode of Mr. Rogers where he brought Margaret Hamilton on to show them, to Aww. show the viewers, I'm an actress. And what we do for the movie, I put makeup on like this. And this is what we do. And like to try and teach kids the difference between movies and real life because she's just so fundamentally uh, you know, like she's she, she's the quintessential movie villain. Yes, she's. <laughs> somebody yes. should do a backstory on that character. You know, right? <laughs> that well, that's I mean, that's crazy too to think about is is how much, you know, it's just we. I mean, it certainly helps that this the book is in the public domain, so people can redo it a thousand and one times. Disney doesn't have to pay to make. Oz the Great and Powerful or Return to Oz. You know, oh, you can oh, do they paid. Oh, they paid. <laughs> I saw those box office receipts. They yeah. paid. Tom is Tom is the only person who is more a fan of Disney's silver screen output from the eighties than he is of the classic catalog. He's like, Yeah, 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 no, no, no. No, no, no. Snow White, Snow White, fine. Great mouse detective, Black Cauldron, uh, Return to Oz. Right. Yeah. I, because oh, I, no. all right, I watched I Return I, I I watched Return to Oz this morning. Okay, and you watch that movie, and some, and that movie must have taken. Let's say uh, conservatively, it was a year from green light to a year to uh, hitting the screens. Mm -hmm. So 
that's it every day for a year. Someone was saying, <laughs> this is okay for children. This is something that we, we believe with all of our hearts and all of our money that children, especially children and the parents that grew up watching the original Wizard of Oz are going to love. And they're going to say, yes, Disney is back every day. Someone, <laughs> someone had to look at the dailies of that woman just taking her head off and looking in her, her room full of heads and saying, yes, kids are we going to be <laughs> running up and down the aisles <laughs> like the Beatles are back and saying, we are in heaven. What the fuck? How did Disney survive okay, Tom, that Tom. period? Uh, his name was Michael Eisner. He came in shortly after that. But the, here's the thing with that. And I look, we'll get back to Wizard of Oz in a second, but I just love that you finally see Return to Oz. Um, that, look, I know that when I watched, because I just rewatched it this morning, you know, uh, Wizard of Oz with the commentary to prep for this. And I know that when I watched it, I thought, yes, I know it feels like Dorothy's story is completely over. And this is where the film ends perfectly with a bow on it. And there's no need to no. continue it. No. But you know what? I think, no, you know what? She needs to get electrotherapy sent to yeah. a goddamn <laughs> hospital where they just discovered this new thing called shocking the shit out of little kids' brains. Oh my gosh. Like, what I, the fuck is it? Tom, I should clarify because we should have asked this. Sir. Carolyn, have you seen Return to Us? Oh, of course I okay. have. Okay. I just want to make sure because okay. if you oh, haven't. What's that guy's name? Which, what? TikTok was one Tick, of the TikTok, yeah. the Clockman, and then the other one is Jack Pumpkinhead, who yeah. is played by Jim Henson's son Brian. Oh, um, is literally just Jack Skellington. Yeah, and Feruza <laughs> Balk is is Dorothy. You know, uh, an age appropriate Dorothy. Yeah, and not not a seventeen year old Judy Garland in the midst in between. You know, fixing for junk. It's <laughs> well, it's funny because Judy Garland. I mean, this was this was uh, the epitome of like them working her to death because she has this and babes in arms in the same year um and margaret hamilton's also in babes in arms um this i mean the the behind the scenes of this film is truly insane um ev everything that could go wrong did go wrong with this movie um you know ranging from this movie had five different directors to um at one point margaret hamilton uh was set on fire not not like figured like James Hetfield and Metallica style um, when the fire went up around her. Apparently, the makeup on her face was flammable. Sure. And she got third degree burns on her hands and face. Unbelievable. That's not the worst thing to happen to someone involving makeup on this movie either. Uh, I don't know if, if you guys are aware, um, but the Tin Man that you see in this film was not the Tin Man that was originally cast. Uh, actor Buddy Ebsen was originally the Tin Man. Our Beverly Hillbilly himself. Correct, yes. <laughs> uh, and Buddy Ebsen was originally the Tin Man, and it turns out uh, the makeup w that they used on him uh, made him so sick he was hospitalized. Oh my gosh. Toxic yeah. nice. <laughs> well, I, it turns out, and this is going to sound wild, you should not uh, put aluminum in makeup. No? This is a wild twist. <laughs> But you they should, should have not. Tried it on the flying monkeys first. Well, it, it, it sounds counterintuitive, but I'll take you word for it. <laughs> um, this, like this, this movie, the dis and, and that's why I was, I was saying to Tom before we started that for us, for this to come at the end uh, of our our first season is pretty fitting because it is, uh, it's kind of a culmination of a lot of things that we have talked about in terms of a lot of characters who have come up over our season, come up here. Um, you know, obviously we we did Gone with the Wind early in this season, and it's worth noting that uh, MGM uh, in this year had both Gone with the Wind and Wizard of Oz. Gone with the Wind, which of course became the most successful film of all time, and Wizard of Oz, and so much personnel was swapped back and forth with this movie. You know, we, we talked about with Gone with the Wind, Gone with the Wind is a case where, um, and in fact, Caroline, just so you know, when we did Gone with the Wind, we had, uh, we had Texans on that episode as well. So, you know, <laughs> you your, your state is... Your Look state you is, they volunteered for it, which is uh, a very brave act of falling on a grenade. <laughs> um, we, uh, it, was, it was one of those cases where they went, uh, why don't we take on with the wind? And I went, no one else is, so you're good. Between that and like taking intolerance, I feel right? like I'm surrounded by heroes. What a, what a, what a gift. Um, <laughs> uh, but with, with Gone with the Wind, you know, obviously that was 
uh, rotated between uh, several directors. In this case, uh, what I think is so interesting with this movie, uh, originally um, the director Norman Torog was uh, signed on to do the film. Uh, Norman Turok, for anybody listening, uh, he was his best known film is probably Boys Town, but the reason people might have heard that name recently is up until 2016, he was the youngest director to ever win Best Director. He won it at the age of 32 for a film called Skippy, and then in 2016, Jamie and Chazelle broke his record uh, by winning for La La Land. The studio, he, Torog had done Technicolor tests because obviously they wanted this film in glorious Technicolor when you got to Oz. Uh, and they needed it to have a different look color wise than their other big color picture, Gone with the Wind, which obviously the, you know, the, the Gone with the Wind has v- bright, vibrant colors as well. But even the texture of those two films is different, I think, you know? Yeah. Um, so they looked at Torag's Technicolor tests. They didn't like him. So they replaced him with a man named Richard Thorpe, who would go on to make. If, if, if you had the same kind of uh, upbringing that I did, those long, arduous sword and sorcery films like Ivanhoe and Knights of the Round Table. He also did a couple of Elvis films, best known for directing Jailhouse Rock. Richard Thorpe is on. And then after a while, they decide, no, we don't want Richard Thorpe either. So after two weeks of shooting, they brought in George Cukor, who's a director that I, I adore, great director. And Cukor was not able to film anything because Cukor was busy directing Gone with the Wind. But they needed somebody to save this movie. So they brought Cukor in to make a lot of creative decisions. Notably, when Cukor came on, Judy Garland was playing the role in a blonde wig oh with what has generously been described as a schoolgirl demeanor because they originally wanted Shirley Temple in the role. So they had Garland playing a, a blonde schoolgirl type performance that was very over the top. And I got to be honest, I, I have not seen any footage of that, but I feel like it's just creepy. Uh, <laughs> like, I feel like it just has to be unsettling. Um, you well, know, I'm glad, I'm glad they managed to find, you know, a low key and subtle performance from her in this movie. Yeah. So but any, you know, they so Cukor was like, we got to favor something a little more naturalistic. Um, but he was too busy filming Gone with the Wind. So as a result, MGM brought in director Victor Fleming. Victor Fleming comes in. And shoots most of the movie, including all of the Technicolor stuff in Oz. Then it turns out that George Cukor, as our listeners might remember, George Cukor gets fired from Gone with the Wind. And they bring in Victor Fleming. They take Fleming off of Wizard of Oz and bring Fleming in to now finish Gone with the Wind. So Cukor is the one who does a lot of the pre-production work on Wizard of Oz. And Fleming takes over for him there. So Cukor can go make Gone with the Wind. Then Cukor gets fired from Gone with the Wind... And Fleming takes over for him there, in which case, now, Tom, do you know, um, you might not, do you know who takes over for Fleming? No, uh, it's not coming to me. That is our old friend from the crowd, King Vidor, one of the greats of the silent era. King Vidor comes in to finish the last of this. Vidor is the one who does all of the the black and white, the sepia tone stuff in Kansas. That makes sense. That's Vidor doing that stuff. And to Vidor's credit, he refused to take credit for directing any of the film until Victor Fleming died because Victor Fleming was a friend and he didn't want to seem like he was trying to take credit away from Fleming. Hmm. But Vidor directed the the Black stuff. And in fact, uh, my favorite King Vidor anecdote is that Vidor is the one who recognized was somewhere over the rainbow. He wanted to make the camera move during that sequence because he felt like every movie up until that point, when there's a solo song, the camera just sits there. And he was like, no, I want it to move. I want it to move with her. I want that to be involved in this, which is why that scene is so great, because it moves with her as she walks through. She leans on the wheel. And he filmed all that. And when they showed it at a uh, test screening, the studio said, it's, it, it, this is bad. We need to cut this song. They wanted to cut Somewhere Over the Rainbow. They felt it was easy. <laughs> right. This is, by the way, not the only time this happens in Hollywood. In fact, to bring it back to Disney, my, you know, that's the, the exact same thing happened 50 years later with, um, with The Little Mermaid, with Part of Your World. It's another case where it's a character singing about the, singing the same kind of song, and the studio said, this is boring, cut it. In both cases, the people involved stood their ground, uh, King Vidor and, and later Howard Ashman, and stood their ground and said, no, you have to keep this in. And sure enough, somewhere over the rainbow to skip ahead, you know, wins an Oscar 
and is widely considered and voted by the American Film Institute to be the greatest song in all of movies. Wow. And it almost wasn't in the film because they thought it'd be boring. Listen, <laughs> Hollywood is dumb. <laughs> <laughs> let's just get because down to it. Let's just, you know, no uncertain terms. They are dumb. And it's been the one constant, uh, the entirety of cinema history. They're dumb. You explaining that Shirley Temple was who they wanted to get to play Dorothy, and they didn't get Shirley Temple, so these gibbering dipshits just said, uh, get a 17-year-old, put her in a wig, and tell her to act like a child is just... Yeah, that's 100% what cinema, what, what film execs do. They did it 10 years ago when looking for Khan in Star Trek Into Darkness, they said, oh, Benicio Del Toro, damn, he just, we had him, but he had to leave. Oh, um, Edgar Ramirez, we had him, and he had to leave. Shit, who should we get? I know, better than Cumberbatch. He'll still be playing Khan, Noonan, Singh, and you'll have to sit down after the movie and go, wait. Benedict Cumberbatch was playing a man named Khan Noonan Singh? Tom, what? Tom, I cannot, you know, this is, you're baiting me because you know how mad I get about this. <laughs> Listen, you I'm know not how angry this fire, makes huh? me. Not even the fact, like, but like even the beginning stages of the Star Trek Into Darkness thing is stupid because it's an Indian character and yeah. they're still thinking, let's cast it like we're doing a 60s TV show and honoring Ricardo Montalban, you know, the world famous not Indian man. It's just a nonstop bar just barrage of everyone who makes decisions in Hollywood should be kicked off a cliff. <laughs> um, uh, we, we, God sake. Um, with this, it, but it is interesting because you know there had been, and we'll talk. I'll, I'll probably talk about this in our little epilogue. But there were there were so many adaptations of this story before, and they were all aimed at children. Right? They were all aimed at. You know, it was just a matter of, like, big pantomimes. The costumes looked very silly and big. You know, you look at there's a 1910 version. And the idea is it's for, it's for kids, you know, ex explicitly and exclusively for children. What I love about this film and the decision it makes is it makes the decision that uh, another film would make that I, I love and I bring up a lot, which is the 1946 Jean Coteau uh, Beauty and the Beast, uh, another remarkable film that, takes a fairy tale seriously without making that mean taking it dark, right? That what this film does so well to me is that it is a movie that every, you know, that children can enjoy, but it is not aimed at kids. Like Carolyn, I'm sure you've seen, you know, especially again, parent of three kids, you've seen films that are aimed specifically at children that are probably that's, that's who they're for is there for children. I mean, I've even seen plenty of, there's no war. The people who were making say, Air Buddies or Beverly Hills Chihuahua were right. not thinking, oh, you know, this is this is something for everyone. Uh, they were like, this is directly aimed at kids, and it can be right. kind of empty and patronizing. There's and then, no like layered storyline there for adults to pick up on different things. Yeah, and at the same time, you know, I'm sure there's stuff that that you watch just for yourself yes. that is maybe too. Uh, setting aside appropriateness is just probably too nuanced or. Uh, uh, just requires maturity to even access like setting aside matters of there are movies that uh, you know you could show any anyone that are technically there's nothing there's no sex or violence but if i show uh, a, uh a, an eight-year-old uh, the best years of our lives they're not gonna vibe with it you know right, right it's, um, it's, it's time to watch <laughs> the movie that you are going to love Modern Romance with Albert Brooks. You loved him in Finding Nemo. Watch him be an absolute goon in relationships. <laughs> now that is, I will say, that is one of those ones that I think a lot, and uh, the episode's not out yet, but uh, kind of, we had uh, comedian Connor Ratliff on for Dr. Strangelove, and he told a story that I adore, which is he said, you know, he, he loved comedy as a kid, and he was, I think he said he was like 11 or 12, was reading a list of the funniest movies of all time, and Dr. Strangelove was number one. <laughs> Oh, wow. So he was having a sleepover for his birthday as a kid, and he went to the video store and ordered a copy of Doctor Strangelove and hyped up all his friends like, "This is the funniest movie ever. We're all going to be cackling." <laughs> and obviously, it's Doctor Strangelove. So he said, "Just slowly, everyone sort of left the room, and no one talked about it." <laughs> um, but in, so in that case, I think about this, and I think about you know what I love about um, Jean Coteau's uh, Beauty and the Beast, and is true of this film too, which is. It is not a movie that is uh, aimed at children, 
so much as it is a movie that decides it is going to take a children's story seriously and there and and by doing so connect to the child I hate to say the child in all of us but the child that we once were and that sense of wonder that we still that all of us still have in some way it's the reason that we still go see the Avengers or Star Wars it's the reason that we have these things that we still connect to as adults is the fact that for the most part I would I dare say you know I, I look uh, we, we we only know each other a little bit Caroline but you clearly you are still a person that has fun and, and you are still a fairly you know I am. Uh, fun person. there's still that you, it's it, you we haven't lost that capacity for wonder and that's what this kind of taps into I feel like one of the ways that they do that and they do that very well is their reliance on practical effects and the, the idea that things still seem like they're happening in a way that feels believable versus like CGI or whatever that I can always spot from a mile away and feel like, you know, whatever those they always age poorly and stuff. But I love the practical effects in this. I love all the different things they do that make me feel like this is magic. This is actually magic I'm watching. Well, it's the thing I, you know, I've, I've said this before on the show a bunch of times. It's pure cinema. This is an experience you can't get anywhere else. I mean, they've made a successful stage play. That's a, I don't know. Is it a prequel? Wicked. I don't know what, what it is. It, I didn't yeah. Tom, shit. it's a prequel. Okay. I didn't see that shit. Um, <laughs> but they have brought it to stage and to six, mod, you know, very high success, but nobody is going to say sitting in a the theater watching, uh, wicked is this you, you get the same experience that you got in 1939 or 1969 or whenever you were a child and watched the wizard of oz and had that feeling of oh wow this is i can't get this anywhere because that from the picture the colors the sound the music all of it cut together in this way under two hours it's you know magic and you either fall for the magic trick or you're me. I was just like, but wait, explain yourself, Tom. <laughs> but I, I will say this to Caroline's point about the practical effects. I think another reason that, that works so well, and I, you know, uh, I love the Jean Coteau Beauty and the Beast for the fact that because it's a fantasy story and because it's meant to be a little unsettling, not scary, but just, you know, you're supposed to feel a little love. Even when the effects don't quote unquote hold up, that still works, you know. Um, today, I mean, look, I, I don't, dislike the Bill Condon Beauty and the Beast remake that came out you know, three, four years ago, where it's a lot of CGI. But it still doesn't get you the way that you watch that Jean Coteau one, and it's uh, the the uh, candlesticks on the wall are literally just people's hands moving. With this, you know, yeah, there are probably ways, we've seen Lord of the Rings, we've seen Harry Potter, we've seen whatever, there are plenty of ways you can do uh, an attacking tree that look more realistic but even though the trees throwing the apples in this look like they fell out of like a Sid and Marty Croft show, that somehow because you're following Dorothy in this strange new world, because she is our conduit to all this, um, it's okay that that stuff doesn't look realistic. It's okay that that stuff just looks weird because the whole journey is, wow, all this stuff looks weird, you know? Uh -huh. And I think it's even more than just, oh, it's a fantasy world and Dorothy's going through. It's a little girl's mind. Yeah. I mean, there, I, there's kind of no other, like, it's a movie that's pretty clearly a girl got conked on the head during a twister and is imagining this elaborate fantasy land, which uh, the sequel then decides, again, no, this is all real. There was a war in Oz. Some, some weird rock man took over, uh, froze all the inhabitants, and, you know. Uh, th there's nightmares everywhere you look, which again, I'm all for traumatize your kids. It's, it's <laughs> always good, but it, so it's okay that, yeah, it's clearly guys in, in, in a tree outfit, grabbing at her and throwing apples at them because she's a little girl. All her imagination can go is the people she's seen around her and just putting them in different slots in this little narrative she's concocting for herself while she's in the middle of a twist of coma. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think about the fact that they changed that from the book? That in the book she really went on the adventure, yeah. But in the movie, it's it's chalked up to a dream. Now it's funny because it's it's I you know I that never bothered me, um, and I think as a as a kid, you know, and growing up and watching it, uh, I recognized that as a welcome change. You know, I was like, oh, that works better because it puts a neat, nice bow on the story in a way that the books are obviously a larger franchise. 
Uh, and I think it, it has a better moral to it in that way, uh, and it lands better that way. That said, when I was researching it for this, uh, and I was seeing those notes of like, oh, audiences aren't going to buy uh, outright fantasy, so you have to add that it's all a dream, or you have to do this. And I kept thinking, like, I'm okay with it here, but I hate it anytime we do that now. It's funny that even as a kid, because it's like the one thing I hate when a movie does. Yeah. As soon as a movie is, oh, it's all a dream. We saw it a few months ago. It, you know, I'm thinking of ending things. The second I got latched onto that idea of, oh, this is all a dream. I was like, no, I don't like this. I just really, I couldn't explain it as a kid. So it's funny that I can now like trace it back to, oh, even as a kid, I hated, I hated movies that were dreams. Well, it feels like it like negates what you just watched. Like it's like, oh, you know, that was all well, just it- fake just a well, dream it negates, too- it negates everything you just watched and it also reduces every character into an idea and not a person so it becomes like well they're not really a thing they're just representing something so what do i care about what's happening see now i don't have a problem because i think that what you've got with that is that what you're if it had been a situation if you did not have the prologue where every character was a one-to-one to someone in her life and you, cause like, that's where I get hung up. I don't like it when you do that in the case of say, uh, more recently, something like Thor, right? The, the, you know, the Marvel movie Thor, when they were too afraid to get weird and make him a God and they had to spend five minutes of exposition of him being like, actually I'm an alien and it's an alien planet that I'm from. You guys are cool with that. And they just happen to think we're gods and whatever. And now obviously, uh, they've just gone uh, the hell with it. We can put a raccoon into space. Like we can do whatever we want. And I love it. I love the balls of that because, quite frankly, people are okay with that. People are cool with that. They will show up. You don't have to. That's the kind of fatal flaw that a lot of movies have where they go, I don't know if people will want something this fantastical. That said, I think if you didn't have that one to one element, I think it would be a problem. But I think what's great about this film is it's something that kids can understand. It's the same way as when you're a kid and you watch so many different Christmas Carol adaptations. And that the Christmas Carol, you know, I mean, of course, Christmas Carol is just this journey of Scrooge with three different ghosts. And then he wakes up and goes, I'm different now. And I think it's the same kind of structure with this in terms of like Dorothy goes on a journey and and learns things about herself in a way that I think that even the youngest kid can can find accessible and kind of recognize the lessons you're supposed to take away from these characters, particularly, you know, that that ending that i i remember loving as a kid you know i and getting as a kid which is that you know the the wizard is a is a shyster and uh you know and is is a is a a hoax and when they get to him and you know say oh i need a heart i need a brain he's like well you had it all along like everything i don't stop telling yourself uh which is something that i think quite frankly a lot of us uh you know it's a, a message that comes across through a lot of movies and a lot of stories and a lot of us still need when we talked about king vidor's the crowd you know there's kind of that element of stop waiting for your train to come in like stop saying oh if only this this whole movie is is using these characters saying if i only had a brain if i only had a heart to help dorothy understand oh yeah i keep saying if only this when really i i, I have everything well, okay, can we talk about this a little bit? Because sure. I have to feel like I actually don't feel like that's how she's starting off. I mean, if everything wasn't going on with Mrs. Gulch, is she running away? Is she thinking like that that this is like such a terrible situation? I don't know. It, that's not like it's set up like for the ending. It's like, see, everything's wonderful at home and you should stay at home. Yet we know Mrs. Gulch is right outside the door and y'all, the troubles are not fixed. But then at the beginning part, she's not, I mean, she doesn't run away because she hates the farm and she hates this whole place and blah, blah. She runs away because her dog is being threatened. And so she needs to take off to save the dog. But it's sort of odd. You, you understand what I'm saying? Like, it's like, there's not that, that, that equation that there's no place like home doesn't actually answer what's going on at the beginning. Now, I would, I would say that's the case if not for, as we talked about, the song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, which is the more... I want to think it's the same way, you know, the little mermaid has a catalyst where she meets the prince and she wants to be with the prince. And that's what makes her go to Ursula the same way that Dorothy has the catalyst of the dog. But you can tell, especially from that song, that really what it is, it's, it's a yearning and it's a, you know, uh, it's a yearning for something else. And this idea that the grass is much greener somewhere else, which is a thing that, we, again, we're all guilty of this feeling of if I just get out of here if i just get out of my small town if i just make this one change it's gonna fix everything and the journey that she takes 
in The Wizard of Oz is not the, the lesson she learns there is not Kansas is better than us. You know, it's not that, but the lesson she kind of learns is every place has issues, every place has troubles. There's no, you know, here she is whisked away to a magical fantasy land that is in full bright color as opposed to her uh, sepia tone town. And, you know, when we first see Oz, when we first see Munchkin Light, it seems so wonderful. Well, I love the little subtle things. Like, there's no kids on the farm. But then it's like Munchkin Lane is like full with all these little vi- vibrant little people that she could just love on. And same with like, you know, you're saying things like alive and dead, like there's like a dead tree there on the farm. But then all the apple trees are all alive and bearing fruit and everything like there, there's really clear differences between the two. So clear beyond just like the sepia and the colorfulness. And that should be wonderful. But then by the end, she really like she's been so she's been through yeah. so much and she <laughs> would not have gotten through it without her friends, these friends she made along the way. And it's the recognition of, you know, home. When it says there's no place like home, that's not a pro-Kansas message. That's not anything like that. But it's rather, right, there's no, you know, you need that family unit that she takes so much for granted. You need that to to get through this. That You know, it helps. I think that that's also why there is an, uh, an extended ending that they cut. I don't know if you guys saw this that would have really made that more complicated. Well, talk um, to us about that, because I don't know about that one. So there's a line that's famously mocked when Dorothy is leaving Oz, right? Where she is saying goodbye to her three friends. And what does she say? And I'll miss you, I'll miss you most of all, Scarecrow. Okay. Do you know why she says that? Because Scarecrow's a big idiot who needs all the love and attention he can get. <laughs> That's a better reason than what they came up with because that line oh God, remains is she in love. That oh, line no. remains in the film because there was an extra scene after she woke up in Kansas, she gets up out of her bed, and that farmhand, oh, uh, no. the farmhand version of the scarecrow says, "I'm like no." <laughs> he says something like, "Well, I'm going off to the big city, or I'm going off to college. I forget what it is." And he says, "Promise me you'll write me." I'll miss you so much. And the implication is that he he's trying to and does uh, romance and marry Dorothy. Oh, my God. Oh boy. Right. That is so that is a thing, like <laughs> once that like. But that's the thing. When you have that element in there, it's so weird and so uncomfortable. And it's it's once you cut that out, once you take that out and you have an ending that is truly just about. It's not a matter of, oh, once I get away, you know, it's the same thing as, I, I think part of it is, look, we all have that, uh, you know, Dorothy's, you know, a young girl, we all have that, like, teenage rebellion years where we're just like, man, I, I fucking hate my parents, I fucking hate this place, I'm gonna get out of this town, and I'm gonna, and life's gonna be so much better, and, and by the time you hit, like, your mid-20s, 30s, you just look back and go, what was I so angry about? Like, right? what was... like I really had a good life. <laughs> but you know what? I think it actually does kind of go to what Caroline was saying um, regarding how, like, there is nothing in the beginning of the movie. Like, yeah, you could say Somewhere Over the Rainbow, but Somewhere Over the Rainbow is, like, proof that there is no, like, proof because it feels like a song that's there, but all the evidence of any problem she had is gone because it feels like taking that ending out is taking out one of the things that's like, Oh, well I'm alone. And like, there's no boys or whatever, or blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, you cut everything out around it. And so her mm-hmm. only problem is I'm too stupid to put a leash on my dog. And now I'm mad. Well, and even there was another route home, Tom, how about yes. that? There it's was like, an additional route. Yet she keeps going by there. Hey, hey, put a leash on your dog, and also go the other way. It's 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 the it's it's farmland. <laughs> There's a lot of open space. Leave right? the angry lady alone. <laughs> yeah, but I see what you're saying because especially if they were saying you could have cut this song, and they were actually pushing for that, that implies that the song didn't even need to be there. That that the grounds for her to take off were 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 clearly there. I now and- I I I disagree. I will push back on that a little bit because that's that's more okay, a matter of push. that that just because the studio said you need to cut doesn't mean they didn't need the song. It just means the studio did not understand what they had and what the the point of the film was, which can honestly happen often with a movie. And and Tom and I have dealt with this on the production side of things too. Sometimes when you've been telling a story for so long and you've been adapting something for so long, you've been working with something for so long, you kind of forget what the audience needs to get there. You kind of just assume, oh, I'm going to cut this and cut this and cut this and they'll still know what it's 
about. And Lord knows we have been with, uh, we have watched, especially back in college, but even after, we've watched uh, test screenings of people's films where we have no idea what's happening. And they think it's so obvious why it's happening because, you know. It gets like that in podcasting, especially when you've done it for a long time with the, with the same co-host, right? You're just, you've got your inside stuff and you're like, well, everybody knows what we're talking about. <laughs> just go, just jump off from here. Keep going. All right. So here's one thing I want to I want to address with this film that I also think is interesting uh, in terms of what could have been. Um, so for all of us, you know, you watch the film and the characters are iconic. And most of these people, when you think of them, even if you know the actor by name, you still think of this role, first of all. Um, you know, Margaret Hamilton never quite escaped the witch. The only person for whom you might jump to something else uh, is, of course, Judy Garland. Maybe you think of A Star is Born, so on and so forth. But even so, her Dorothy is so distinct and definitive that it can't possibly be anything else. The reason I say that is that there were two other people approached for the role of the wizard originally who are so distinct and so frequently parodied prior to this and, and after this that I, I just keep thinking about how different that would have been. The original person they spoke to was actor Ed Wynn. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. Yeah, right. Um, who is, of course, so distinct. Uh, welcome to the... Welcome to us. <laughs> and, like, you can see why they had the instinct there. Um, yeah. And then Ed Wynn turned it down because he felt the part was too small. Um... And then the other person they spoke to was W.C. Fields, um, which meant that the wizard would have been played a lot more drunk. And, you know. Well, you know who it should have been? Who? It should have been Orson Welles. <laughs> <laughs> Prepare Dorothy, Hello, the Dorothy. famous rich and famous contract. Hello, Dorothy. I'm the wizard, and yes, I'm a con man. But you know what? I've been very successful with this wine business I've made. Would you like some stocks in my wine? Ah. Listen to Tom. You should use that voice all the time. <laughs> it happens more <laughs> often than you'd think. Did you guys know that Professor Marvel actually wore L. Frank Baum's coat? So what I love about that—that's that's the that's the thing. They bought the coat. Uh, yeah, right. They bought it from a thrift shop, right? Yeah. yeah. And inside L. Frank Baum. Um, now, what's funny is on the commentary for the film that I was listening to, they said yes, and his wife, you know, Baum's widow, confirmed that that was his jacket. Uh, he goes, you know, journalists for decades have been feverishly trying to prove or disprove that story. My stance is if it didn't happen, it should have. And I'm like, yeah, yeah that's I'm good with that. Um, <laughs> it's one of these strange things with this movie. It has been in the pop culture for so long. It has saturated the pop culture in so many ways that... You know, so much is built up around it. There are so many things, uh, whether they're stories, trivia, urban legends, so many things that get brought up. I mean, you know, there's the the oft-repeated uh, urban legend that you can see someone hanging themselves in the background of a shot. Now, of course, that's been disproven many times. It was a bird because they had had birds brought on set for a scene that they ended up using. Uh, and that's just a shadow of that. Uh, there's the uh, famous, the famous story that uh, if you play Dark Side of the Moon while watching Wizard of Oz, it sinks up, which is something that when I was 15, I thought was 100% true, and I totally felt it when you watched it. And now that I'm older and have tried it again, you kind of go, eh, it doesn't really work. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's like one or two times where you go. Yeah, like Great Gig in the Sky kicks in, uh, I think, around the time of the tornado. So you go, sure, yeah, that, that kind of works. And then uh, when they say the lunatic is on the grass, uh, the, the, uh, the scarecrow jumps on the grass. But it's not exactly a one-to-one -one there. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a case of, you know, simple math. Hey, this album is shorter than this movie. So, no, it does not sync <laughs> up. <laughs> But, you know, but it is a thing because I think there's this temptation, too, with this movie. It is Tom's right. It's disturbing. And that's kind of what draws people in. Like, you know, if you're a kid, you watch it and it's a little bit creepy and it's a little bit whimsical. And then whoever you grew up to be as a person, you either only focus on the whimsical elements or only focus on the creepy elements. And if you're only focused on the whimsical elements, you forget about kind of the darker parts of this movie. And if you're only focused, you know, if you're a more dark person, you only think of 
the dark elements of this movie and this story. And, and then you're looking for someone hanging themselves in the background. You're looking for some kind of weird, messed up stuff, you know? Or, or you're a child like me and says, this shit isn't dark enough. Give me something worse. <laughs> and like you got it. Needing, like a junkie yeah. needing his fix. <laughs> They were. They answered you. With you a got. Website yeah. Board. You got men's <laughs> men with wheel arms and stuff. So if only I got. had. If only I had Disney <laughs> Plus when I was a child. And you know, not only just men wheel men with the freak, you know, whatever, but like the only TikTok I'll ever appreciate. <laughs> um. Again, it comes back to this thing, and it's kind of tough. I mean, look, there's a lot of elements of this film to talk about, but you know, when we did Star Wars, which I think is pretty similar, like we mentioned, like it's almost harder to talk about these kind of movies than the lesser known ones because you just kind of feel like if the argument is you know oh why is this film worth preserving you go well because it's because it's the wizard of oz like this is just familiar yeah it's so entrenched with us that yeah we all have memories for different reasons whether they're good or bad yeah Uh, not with tom i didn't know so many bad but now (laughs) i know include the bad now i'm curious caroline with you i mean because one thing we haven't talked about really with this movie Mm-hmm. is you know obviously we've touched on dorothy but of course there's the scarecrow the tin man the the lion you know these these uh these quintessential characters that pop up and join her along the way now i'm here i'm going to start with this it's a simple question but of the three who's your favorite oh well i'm a little biased because my youngest is named jack daly Okay. So and spelled like Haley. So I feel like the lion for me, he's just he's just so cute. Like, <laughs> come on, come on. I'm kind of drawn to him. He he's the one that I feel like, especially as a kid, you know, you feel you feel little, you feel scared. And to to feel like, you know, someone understands that and then and then gets brave feels right to me. How about you guys? I was all I you know, when I was a little kid, the Tin Man was my favorite. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't quite know why other than the fact that, uh, I liked his, his vibe and his song. And maybe it was cause I was a little theatrical kid and I wanted, uh, I was like, if I'm going to play one of these parts one day, I can't dance. So scarecrows out, uh, <laughs> stiff and uncomfortable. I got this. Um, you know, I, I do the like, I want to see you do that move. <laughs> uh, which is, I think, I think was just compressed air and, and baby powder, which is just yeah. such a, a simple effect. Um, I, as I've gotten older, I think I like the scarecrow, uh, more, uh, that, that said, uh, I, I, well, first Tom of, of the three, who's your favorite? I'm going to go with scarecrow simply because I, uh, I think even to this day that um makeup effect is pretty fucking yeah. spectacular like you don't see the seams of where the makeup ends and his face begins like it looks just like a complete just like he is a, a man made out of a, a sack yeah. um but uh again to bring back to return to oz i greatly prefer those character designs because the tin man in that movie looks like he was taken out of one of those old fleischer superman shorts <laughs> um the, the the scarecrow looks like a literal nightmare and the the lion is just a big like uh, lion that you would like maybe uh, he he, he kind of reminded me of the uh, ghost of Christmas present in Muppet Christmas Carol Muppet's Christmas Carol. <laughs> Come on in and know me better, man. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Scarecrow is uh, my guy. He's got a great uh, also the Batman connection. Come on, I'm a nerd. Well, and apparently he gets the girl. So Ugh. and yeah, there's in also- 1939, which means getting the girl right before she gets to middle school. Yeah, there you go. I I think that with the other thing with the Scarecrow is I I do think you know we talked about scary moments and disturbing moments in this film. Truly, the the witch yelling to have a little fire, Scarecrow, and launching the flame at him is terrifying in a way. You know, you just because it's it establishes how vulnerable he is. Because well, um, you also know the actor would probably literally burst yes, into flames if that stuff went wrong. Also true. The other thing, I want to address one thing with this, which is um, I've watched this movie you know, countless times. You know, Caroline, you said you have as well. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's, it's so ingrained in the popular culture. And I think that, you know, if somebody came to you and said, I, I think, at least for me, if somebody came to me and said, can you sing somewhere on the, over the rainbow? I could. And if somebody said, if I only had a brain, of course, follow the yellow brick Yeah, these are all in my brain. And if somebody said, can you sing the second song the lion has in this movie? I would say he doesn't have a second song. Because I never remember that he has a second song in this film. It's one of those few things that throws me off with this one. Because he does, he has that thing about the, you know, when I, if I were king and that kind of, that song... And I guess that strikes me weird in part because why does he get a second song and no one else does? Oh, also, right. down with the uh, down with the king system. We need democracy <laughs> in Oz. 
But I, I that that one. Was, <laughs> there's there's so much in this that you know, and it's weird because I guess that there are songs in this that don't necessarily stick with you. I guess, at least to me, uh, you know, in the the merry old land of Oz, clean 'em up sequence is a weird one. I think if I was a kid and you told me about this song, you know, you're out of the woods, I probably wouldn't have remembered it until they use it again on the Sopranos. But the other songs, you know, follow the yellow brick road, ding dong, the witch is dead. Um, and these have just endured so well and so vividly. Why do you guys think that is? Like, there's there's so many songs we were just doing Muppet Christmas Carol, and <laughs> good luck naming a song from there, guys, because mm, I, even though you sing along a little, maybe you're humming uh, along. Excuse me. We're, excuse we're Marley no, and Marley. We're Marley and Marley. Yeah, I love I, you know what, Tom. Jack I love that we Marley had the same one yesterday. No, I agree with you guys fully, but you know what I'm saying. Not all songs make it, so. Well, also to go back to the Disney loving to cut out the best songs in the goddamn movie thing, they cut yeah. out the best goddamn song in Muppet Christmas yes, Carol. That's true. And luckily it has been found and is being reinserted into the movie for a nice 4K release. Can't wait to see Michael Caine uh, put way more effort into a goddamn Muppet movie than uh, anyone deserves. Uh, Michael Caine uh, does not know Muppets aren't real. Only agreed to take the part if you played it seriously. Um, so I, I think to answer your question, Carol, why they endure, I think part of it is that it, songs movie songs endure so much better when they're paired with with you know memorable images right i think that that's one element of it there's a reason why when you look at the songs that have won best original song at the oscars they tend to go to songs that are attached to lavish sequences you know uh the reason that uh you know uh the song jai ho won in 2008 and bruce springsteen's the wrestler isn't even nominated is in part because the wrestler song plays over the credits. Jai Ho is a lavish dance number. Um, with this, partly it's that. Partly it's that you can't hear Ding Dong, The Witch is Dead without picturing the Munchkin Village. And you can't hear Follow the Yellow Brick Road without picturing him jumping down the Yellow Brick Road. I also think that most of those songs uh, have very simple choruses and very memorable, simple melodies where it's easy for them to get stuck in your head. You know, they're practically, you know, follow the yellow brick road is pretty much the lyrics are almost exclusively follow the yellow brick road. Uh, <laughs> Ding dong, the witch is dead. Same way. And they, they, uh, you know, they're, they're easier to stick in there. They're almost like nursery rhymes. You know, they are, they are the kind of songs that would be sung to you as a child. They stick with you that way. The same way that row, row, row your boat sticks with you when you're a kid. And you could, you know, if you, you, a five-year-old is probably going to be able to remember that a lot easier than Rush's twenty-one twelve or something like that. You know, I don't know. I mean, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe your kids are huge Rush fans. I don't know. Um, Traumatize your kids and then also make them listen to twenty-one twelve. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Funny. No more SoundCloud rappers. Only Rush. Exclusively Rush for our youth. Look, get, if you're going to give them an iPad to keep them busy because you you just don't want to deal with them. Load it up with 2112. Just all day long, 2112. Block access to TikTok or whatever new thing that the Chinese are using to spy on our children. Just 2112. <laughs> and if you want, throw some Tom Sawyer in there. It's a lot more rush talk than I was expecting on our Wizard of Oz episode. <laughs> uh, I will say, you know, I want to throw out a couple little things uh, before we start uh, winding down. One, I've mentioned some of the other connections to films we've covered on this on this show uh, i've mentioned gone with the wind and king vidor but do either of you guys know that there is a connection to snow white and the seven dwarfs in this film i do okay but do tell please <laughs> I, i'll let you have this one you know it, okay okay i have to remember though it was the the lady saying the part that um i know she got paid like a thousand dollars i don't have know adriana casalotti Yes. The voice of snow white is the juliet in, in the tin man line, song right yep. she only sang the Wherefore art thou Romeo, right? Yep. yep. Yes. So she I is. I pulled that out of my brain, you guys. That was hard. <laughs> but and Caroline also hinted at a lot of differences in the book. Um, yeah. You know, in the book, uh, mice rescue them from the poppy fields. Uh, they also encounter people made out of China and these hammerhead characters. And perhaps the most interesting. Um, and Tom strap in for this one. Uh, yeah. In the book, the Tin Man's backstory involves having a love affair with a munchkin and a witch cursing his axe so that the axe cuts off a piece of him one part at a time, one arm, one leg, so on and so forth. But he just goes down to the tinsmith and has each part replaced by a metal arm, a metal leg. And that's how he becomes a Tin Man. He's yeah. not turned yeah. into tin. He 
Yeah, Replace. they mention that in Return to Oz, and I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> this is, pardon the pun, but this is fucking metal. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's pretty wicked. Did, yeah, there we go. There's there a pun. We go. The only other thing I want to note on this, um, well, two things. One, uh, Busby Berkeley apparently choreographed a full dance number for If I Only Had a Brain, and they just didn't use it. Um, <laughs> and two, one thing we have not addressed, and Tom... You can complain about this film, or you can have qualms. Toto is great. Well, listen, he's oh. a good boy. Um, <laughs> Actually, a girl. Best. It was it was a female dog that played Toto. Well, you know what? Don't don't uh, don't assign a gender to her. Okay. Uh, all do- also, all dogs are boys. All cats are girls. <laughs> this is science. Right. This is science. Well, like yeah, Simpsons, right? Dogs, cats living together. <laughs> well, it's it's just Toto is a good boy. Dorothy should have been leashing him, but you know what? He wasn't leashed, and Miss Gulch, she deserved a nip in it too. She deserved to get her entire day ruined. Chris. Oh, will you all make a shirt after this? Make a shirt after this that say, like, uh, like Mrs. Gulch deserved a nip in. <laughs> it's, she it's, deserves a nip in. It is what. <laughs> It is wild watching it, and at the beginning when she's talking about, you know, I know she wants to get the dog, but when she goes, I'm taking him to the sheriff to make sure he's destroyed. What a yeah. word. She says destroyed. it. Destroyed. They're going to strap him to some TNT and just watch the show. <laughs> they're not just going to just drown him. They're not going to no. just put a bullet in his little head. No, they're going to destroy him like he's a fucking <laughs> building that needs to be cleared to put up another parking lot. They're just going to stand in front of him and be like, you're a dis- disappointment to your parents. You've always been terrible. You know what? We keep trying to we keep shampooing your hair and it keeps looking like this. You got split ends. You're a real asshole. <laughs> you're destroyed. You're... Oh, no. All oh, right. Hilarious. We always wrap up talking about how the film fared at the Oscars. So I do want to address this. Um, we have talked about the year 1939 twice on the show already because it is possibly the greatest year in the history of cinema. And Wizard of Oz plays a part in that. The nominees for Best Picture that year at the Academy Awards are Dark Victory, Goodbye Mr. Chips, Love Affair, which of course would be remade as an affair to remember, Uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Ninochka, Of Mice and Men, Stagecoach, Wuthering Heights, and the winner, Gone with the Wind, along with Wizard of Oz, one of the fellow nominees. (laughs) So just a murderer's row of, of nominees for Best Picture. Wizard of Oz was nominated for Best Picture, lost to Gone with the Wind. It was nominated for Best Original Score, which it won. Uh, It was nominated for Best Original Song for Somewhere Over the Rainbow, which it won. It lost Best Art Direction to Gone with the Wind. And it was nominated for Best Special Effects, but lost to a film called The Rains Came, uh, which is just about a big rainstorm. Uh, I, I think that, of course, now the film is so revered, it's hard to believe that that's all it got recognized for but of course that's in part because gone with the wind was unstoppable that year it was the it was the return of the king of its year um but i take the the best original song win i'm very happy about and the best original score win is a surprise you would have thought that would have also gone to gone with the wind but mgm was running the table that year at the oscars pretty impressive when you factor it all together now of course you know, Victor Fleming wins Best Director. I guess they kind of gave it to him for directing both of these films. But, you know. <laughs> I think you defended the score very well during this podcast about why it's so memorable and wonderful. So you gave the full on <laughs> argument for it. And I, I also like that Gone with the Wind score quite a bit. But this is just it's just no follow the yellow brick road. No. Uh, well, it's one of those cases <laughs> where and we count this a lot when we talk about the Oscars, especially in retrospect, is that. You just take a little while to. It's not like a oh, grave injustice. We go, oh, it's cool they recognize this. Like that's that's cool that they gave this credit. You know, it's like when we talk about how Doctor Strangelove got a Best Picture nomination. Probably wouldn't even happen today. It's it's cool that they recognized it. You know, didn't win, but it, it's cool that it got the it got the nod that it did. Uh, Caroline, thank you so much for joining us. This was a, a lot of fun. I'm so glad you agreed to do this, and I hope it was uh, I hope it was an interesting discussion for you as well as much as it was for us. Uh, I had a lot of fun with you guys. I hope that we can do it again sometime. Absolutely. Did you have anything you wanted to plug on your on your way out? Well, I can let everyone know that they can come and check out Pod Clubhouse over on Instagram and Twitter and um, Facebook and all the great places that you can hit on social media. We're over on Apple 
podcasts and just everywhere. So just come on, check things out. Yeah, what's a little bit, just a brief pitch, what what Pop Clubhouse is all about? Because I know you've got a bunch of different things going on. Yeah, we do. So we cover a lot of different things, mostly within TV, but we're kind of branching out into movies and stuff. And the, the main part of it is that we mix and match hosts, just like you guys are doing right now, so that we can get a variety of voices on different podcasts. And, you know, we when we do that, we end up with a whole bunch of different feels and tones and stuff for all different shows so we mix and match within different episodes of the same show but then we also do like love it and leave it or we'll do a little interview with a podcast where you can come over and kind of we say speed date a podcast and see if it's right for you i i hear that there's every episode of interview with the podcast is great except one um, the, <laughs> they're the, all hilarious because we all get so silly you know the guy the guy from you're missing out that you had on was terrible but every every other episode i stand by we laughed like, for so long with you come on that was <laughs> so funny and like the funniest thing is that like always we start off super calm and cool and like we're gonna be real professional by the end you were like is this is this on <laughs> are we still recording because we just get so so silly and out there so i appreciate it <laughs> and if people want to find you where can they find you on the socials you can always come hit me up at Tweet to Caroline. That would be the best spot. <laughs> Caroline, thank you so much for joining. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks, guys. It's nice meeting you, Tom. <laughs> nice meeting you, too. Thanks for coming. I'm not sure what more I can add about The Wizard of Oz. Um, my experience is probably in line with Tom's. I don't exactly remember when the first time I saw it, but I feel like it was a young age. And I left with an impression of that what I was seeing was impressive, but it didn't resonate with me in the way that, you know, it did with my family. Um, one of the few movies that my dad will actually list as a favorite, if you're like, what are your all time favorites, um, is Wizard of Oz. So the fact that we've never um, necessarily bonded over that has always been interesting to me. Um, Wizard of Oz is also. Uh, show that um helped me with my relationship with theater growing up too uh, i got to um be a part of a community theater production only this time um i wanted to do a lot of the backstage work so um it was cool to kind of get that that aspect and sort of see just how integral wizard of oz was for so many people because again i think at the end of the day you know sort of kind of to wrap it up and bring it back to our initial question of where is home, you know, home is, I think at the end of the day for me is like the community that you build, um, you know, your own, uh, whether like people call it like a shared family or, or, a, or a, not a shared family, but like a selected family, you know, it's the, it's the friends and people that you, uh, that you meet and inspire, uh, that inspire you. Um, and I guess, you know, even though it's never really resonated with me, to that level the the impact that it has had um on so many is hard to uh deny so i i think you would uh have a hard time finding anybody who would uh, disagree uh with its uh with its pick in the registry now i have a little surprise for you guys and as of us recording this it is not yet ready but it will be ready soon okay um i think it's important uh to to make sure we get this show out to as many people as we can and, and do little things we can to promote the show. Uh -huh. um, so I was speaking with a, a past guest uh, of our show. Uh, that would be Mr. Jeremy Swanton, uh, oh. who was on our show for Singing in the Rain. Uh, hi, Jeremy. I mean, I know now, you can't like hear me, but, you know, hi. I don't know if you guys are aware uh, of what Jeremy has, was doing over the course of quarantine. No. Uh, he filmed a one-man show version of the musical Wicked. Wait, that's right. Film. I'm sorry. I do know about this. Yes, right. I've seen bits and pieces of it. Okay, and he is playing every role in costume and has filmed it and released it on YouTube bit by bit. Now, I don't just want to promote our show. I want to promote that because he didn't have it when we were doing Singing the Rain, but he has it now. And I thought, what's a way that we can do something to promote both of those? And so as we are recording this, uh -huh. uh, Jeremy has purchased the costumes and is uh, at present, I believe, filming himself performing a medley of songs from the motion picture The Wizard of Oz and will be making a similar montage video of him performing the wizard of oz 
for our show, uh, as all the characters. So what I'm going to do right now, gentlemen, if you have access to your email, is I'm actually going to email you, uh, if I can pull it off, yes, email you the pictures he sent me of him in the costumes. And when such time comes as he is ready, I hope that we'll be able to uh, get together and record uh, your reactions in real time to what he has done. And if there's time, we will tack it on to the end of the episode. But if you gentlemen would just check your email um, that I usually email you at and, and you should be able to see the pictures. I am I am physically speechless. Like I like I cannot like I cannot find the right words to say right now. I am in absolute awe. This is so awesome. I just got the email. Hang on one. Oh, oh my oh, god. Oh. This is amazing. What? We've had this planned for a couple months. Uh, oh my god. Oh, this is oh this is absolutely oh my god. Oh, dude. So to oh our listeners, God. by the time you're listening to this episode, that video will be available. We'll post it on our social media channels. Please check it out and check out Jeremy's other videos. We have, guys, we have really cool freaking friends. Oh, my God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Wow. I, I think my favorite was the fact that Jeremy and I talked about this well over a month ago. And then one day I just get a text of him in his Cowardly Lion costume his selfie in the Cowardly Lion costume, having no memory of the context for it. And I was just like, why is this happening? I love it. No, I, I cannot wait. Yes, you, you tell me time and place and, and, and we will make it. Who knows? Maybe we'll make it a, a live reaction if uh, on a certain uh, live streaming uh, channel that we may or may not be working on for future, uh, for future events. You never know. But wink, yeah. wink, nudge, or, we'll tack it, or we'll tack it onto the end of this. We'll see. But um, more importantly, uh, I wanted you guys to know that was happening. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Jeremy. No, I'm, I'm super psyched for this. I, I, yeah, I have no idea what to expect, but I, I have seen bits and pieces of his, uh, his, uh, his wicked, his wicked stuff. And I mean, it's just, you, you are an absolute God. Let me just tell you. I mean, I just, it is truly, un, it, I cannot believe how freaking talented you are, Jeremy. So yes, thank you. Thank you. And, uh, yes, please go check out, uh, his stuff if you haven't. Um, so to wrap up, like we usually do, what films would you guys include in the registry? Reminder to our audience, it must be an American film that's at least 10 years old. Okay, so my pick kind of came pretty easily. Structurally, it's very similar to uh, Wizard of Oz. Tonally, it's nothing like the Wizard of Oz. It's its own unique thing from a filmmaker with his own unique vision and style and tone. That is only him. It is arguably his crowning achievement, the most him movie. I kind of fell in love with this movie, and I think if we're dealing with talking about a movie that's about, you know, the balance between reality and dreams and what is in front of us and all sorts of stuff like that, uh, oversimplifying it because I'm uh, not doing an entire episode about this, but uh, the movie I have picked is Brazil. By Terry Gilliam. Uh, it's surprisingly not in the film registry. Uh, I feel like it should be at some point. Uh, I think it's an unbelievable movie. It uh, does the one of the best clear cases of being inspired by The Wizard of Oz without just being a Wizard of Oz pastiche. Uh, it does its own thing. It's uh, sad. It's beautiful. It's funny. It's tragic. It's all. It's it's everything. It's uh, maybe Terry Gilliam's uh, best movie. Um, I think the film industry uh, would be uh, uh, more fulfilled uh, once Brazil enters the uh, the lexicon. So for me, I had to think about this one. This was one of the ones I struggled with the most, in part because I was like, okay, well, do you just pick another quintessential childhood movie? And so I had things in mind, things like The Iron Giant, so on and so forth. But I'm like, none of those are the quintessential childhood movie in the way that The Wizard of Oz is. Nothing else is The Wizard of Oz. And then I started thinking about what purpose the registry serves, um, especially because not that long ago, the registry picked its newest for when we're recording this, the registry picked its newest class of films. And you had the films that everybody heard went, Oh, the dark Knight, Of course that deserves to be in there. But then they look at another one and go, Oh, this devil, whatever. I've never even heard of that. Why is that in there instead of this? And I think that's because we forget that the purpose of the national film registry isn't just 
oh, it's a list of great movies. There are plenty of people that do that, the AFI and, and so on and so forth. But that's not what it's about. It's about selecting the films that need to be preserved, that even if all else fails, even if the studio fails, even if all the uploads go away, that it is preserved by an act of Congress. The, the reason I bring that up is the fact that a lot of the films that are in the registry and ones we'll be covering, especially in future seasons, are in there because of the necessity of preservation, are in there because otherwise they would be lost. Do you guys happen to know that there is there have been several adaptations prior to this film of, of L. Frank Baum's story? Uh, there was a 1910 version and there was a 1908 version called The Fairy Log and Radio Plays which was a performance film featuring L. Frank Baum himself and used a bunch of theatrical techniques. Uh, it was similar to Gertie the Dinosaur uh, in the way that Baum would actually take this film on tour with him and speak to the film and give narration. Have, have either of you guys ever seen it? No. I, I have not, no. Yeah. It, you know how I know you haven't? Um, it's lost. It's gone forever. The very first adaptation of The Wizard of Oz is completely gone. Um, there's no way to see it. This film is lost forever because people failed to preserve it. And that sticks with me. And so I was thinking about that and I was thinking about The Wizard of Oz itself is an indelible part of our culture. It is a quintessential piece of American art. And as such, we should do everything we can to preserve the history of how it came to be, much how anybody who is a fan of the Universal Monster movies uh, also wants to watch things like Edison's Frankenstein to see how did we get here. So my pick for preservation of the registry is the 1910 Wizard of Oz adaptation, which is a short adaptation. Uh, it's not a faithful adaptation. Toto is replaced by a cow named Imogene. Uh, you know, it's very weird. It, it's kind of redoing the 1902 stage musical. Uh, for a while, people thought the footage was from the fairy log and radio plays, and it's not. It's a very bizarre film and it's it's certainly not up to the level of the 1939 i don't want it in the registry because i think it's particularly stellar or mind-blowing i don't think it should be there for any reason like that but i do believe that it is absolutely essential that we act to preserve things like this the missing links in how we got from one place to another in terms of our art and our culture because it's crucial not to forget these things and it's very easy to think that something like this was us came fully formed out of one genius's mind and we never had anything like it. But, you know, it's important to see the evolution of that. So for me, I think the 1910 Wizard of Oz uh, should be in the registry, just as I wish someone <laughs> had preserved the fairy log and radio plays from 1908. I think you need this in there to show how we got to where we are. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Caroline Daly for joining us. Check out her work with Pod Clubhouse on Twitter and Instagram at Pod Clubhouse. You can also follow Caroline at Tweet2Caroline. You can also follow our co-hosts on social media, where you can find Mike at NKOAS and Tom at RagingBull1990. While you're there, be sure to follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at YMO Podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. It really helps a little show like ours. If you know some friends who might like the show, tell them about it. And if you have someone you think would make a great guest for an upcoming film, tell us about it at yourmissingoutpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you again next time. Till then, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home.